Okay, great. So welcome to my talk. I hope you enjoyed the conference. It's been really great to be finally back here in Aspen. So this is a talk about performance. So I need to start with a disclaimer. You should never do any optimization without running your own benchmarks first. In particular, you should not just implement something because somebody told you that it is fast. All my benchmarks are run on a 2020 Apple Mac Mini running as I Linux and Clang 14, which is most likely not the setup that you're targeting. So don't just copy any of my benchmark results. Um, feel free to ask questions at any time during the talk, but if you have any comments, please hold them during the end. Um, I'm doing some things a bit weird for dramatic effect, so just hold any comments until the end. It will probably be resolved by then. So I'm going to optimize a dispatch loop, uh, which looks something like so. We've got a while, and then we've got a switch, and we want to make that fast. What I'm not concerned with is the performance of, for example, enum to spring if that is going to spend up like a, be a significant perform performance issue, like something's going really wrong. I'm also, like, this is an example that was taken from work. Uh, so we uh, think that we do a PowerPoint plugin. So we need to do a lot of PowerPoint stuff. And in this case, we want to handle the slide master specially. So we've got a switch to do that, then a default. And somebody asked whether that was really the best way to do it. Uh, somebody pointed them to my talk. And, but this is not what the talk is about, right? Um, you should write that something like so. So we've got an enum set. We can use, then ask for a subset and do it like so. Um, I would just use this opportunity to mention that we're hiring. So if you're looking for a job, consider applying. So what I am talking about is something like so. So we want to pass a binary file, for example. So we've got some header. Um, then we switch over the header type and pass some payload, depending on that. And then we do that repeatedly in a loop. So this can end up being a performance issue. So we might want to look into that to make it fast. And of course, there's the canonical example. We want to write a bytecode interpreter. So we've got a sequence of instructions, and we want to execute them uh, accordingly. This is was sort of my motivation to look into that during the last summer about this small little bytecode interpreter. So I wanted to optimize that sort of code. And this is also the example that I'm going to go with to the talk. So let's define a simple stack-based bytecode. So what is a bytecode? Uh, bytecode uh, are instructions that consist of a single byte. So we've got a bytecode opcode, which is an U and 8 enum, and then we've got various instructions in there. And then an instruction is either the opcode directly or some one byte payload. So we either got an unsigned integer value or we've got an signed integer offset. And then the bytecode <laughs> itself is just a vector of this instruction. And each instruction starts with, an, with the opcode and then has multiple optional bytes for the payload. The bytecode is stack based. And this means that instructions don't access registers, they modify a value stack or vstack for short. For example, we have a push instruction which pushes a constant onto the vstack. And that constant is specified as payload in the next byte of the bytecode. For example, we can have ABC, and then we want to push 42, and now 42 is on top of the stack. We can also do operations on the stack. For example, add pops two values from top of the stack, adds them, and pushes the sum back on the, the stack. And this instruction does not take any payload. And with that, we can write a very simple example that just sums three numbers. So we push one and two. So now the vstack is at the right. So we have one and two on the vstack. Then we add, which pops them and pushes the three instead. Then we push another three. And then the final add gives us six. And that way, we can do a basic arithmetic. One problem with a vstack is what happens if we want to use the same value twice. right? So we just have the result of our sum. We want to modify it, but also use it later on. Uh, yeah, so how do we use the same value multiple times? And for that, we can duplicate it. So the dupe instruction simply duplicates whatever is on top of the vstack. So now it's on there twice. And then we can just pop it once, and it's still there. A similar problem might happen if the values on the vstack are in the wrong order. So for example, um, we might have pushed uh, two numbers on the stack due to some other computation. And now we want to subtract them, but we want to subtract them in the other way around. And for that, we can use swap. So this simply uh, pops two values and pushes them back in the opposite order. And there are more sophisticated stack operations, but we don't need them for the example. So for control flow, the, our interpreter maintains an instruction pointer, or IP for short. Um, a normal instruction simply increments the instruction pointer past the opcode and then any data. So for example, after a push, we will increment it by 2 because we've got one byte of data. And after an add, we will increment it by 1 uh, since we don't have any data. A jump instruction increments the uh, instruction pointer by the offset that is specified as payload. So that way, we can implement a loop, for example. So after the loop, we want to go back to the beginning. This is then a jump instruction. And then we also need conditional jumps. Otherwise, our loop would just be infinite. Um, this will increment the instruction pointer by an offset, but only if the top of the vstack is non-empty. So it will pop one value from the vstack. If it's non-empty, it will jump by offset. Otherwise, it will skip the jump instruction and continue on normally. 
<laughs> Finally, we want function calls, and for simplicity, we are only allowing a single function. So our entire bytecode program is essentially that function. Its arguments are pushed onto the vStack before the call, and when the function finishes, it leaves a single return value on top of the vStack, which is the result of the function. Then instead of call, we just have recurse. Since we only have one function, we can only do recursion. And recurse simply saves the instruction pointer and goes back to the beginning. And then we can execute it again on a different <coughs> call frame. And then return. When we're done, we want to go back to the caller. So we jump to the last saved instruction pointer. And the instruction pointer is saved on the call stack or C stack. This is a separate stack to ensure that we don't mi mix it with values. And this allows us to call like multiple functions. <laughs> so as an example, let's see a program that computes a Fibonacci recursively. Um, this isn't really the uh, implementation that you actually want. But it is nice because it has exponential um, runtime, which in our case is convenient because with just a few code, we can get lot many executions for benchmark. So the idea is that uh, we, we compute the n Fibonacci number. So if n is less than 2, that is just n. So zero, the 0 Fibonacci number is 0, and the first one is 1. Otherwise, we sum the two previous ones. And this is the bytecode. So we start with n on the vStack, and we want to put FIBO n onto the vStack. So we first do the comparison. We don't want to remove n, so we duplicate it, push 2, and compare it against 2. Now we have the top of uh, the comparison on the vStack, and we do a conditional jump. So if you're greater than or equal to 2, we skip down to the duplicate. Otherwise, we continue with the return. Since n is now on top of the vStack, that is now the correct result. So we just return and return the uh, n itself back to the caller. Otherwise, we've entered that uh, duplicate instruction. Uh, here, we want to subtract one, but also be duplicated so we can keep it. So we subtract one and recurse. So this will then compute the n minus 1 number and put it on top of the vStack. Um, we then have it in the wrong order. So we do a swap to put the n on top, subtract 2 from it, and recurse again. Finally, we've got our two on the stack, so we add them and return. You don't need to understand all the details about why this is correct. Um, programming like with a stack-based interpreter is a bit uh, tricky to do by hand. You just need to understand like the basics of how each instruction in isolation works. I can promise you that this uh, bytecode is, in fact, correct. So are there any questions uh, at this point? OK, so let's, interpret, uh, so let's write an interpreter for that bytecode. So we need to maintain four things of state. The instruction pointer, which is simply a pointer to the correct bytecode instruction, um, a pointer for the vStack. So our vStack is just an int array. And the vStack pointer points to the next free stack slot onto the, on the vStack. Similarly, we've got the call stack. This is just uh, stores um, like the instruction pointer. So we've got an array of those. And also remember the current top. And then the bytecode itself, so we can jump back to the beginning. And then each um, execute instruction is implemented very straightforwardly. For example, push just takes the thing in the payload, which is at the next offset, and pushes it on top of the vStack. And then we increment the instruction pointer by 2 to go to the next instruction. Duplicate, um, so the top of the vStack is at offset minus 1, since the vStack pointer is always 1 behind. So we take uh, minus 1, that is the top value, and then we push it again. And then we increment by 1, since this time we don't have any payload in the bytecode. Add or subtract or comparison and so on, they all look the same. So we pop the operands, <laughs> compute the result, and push it back on the vStack, and then increment by 1. A conditional jump, for example, it just pops the value from the vStack. If it's non zero, then we jump to the offset. Otherwise, we skip past the opcode and offset. Recurse saves the instruction pointer on the call stack. The only thing to note is that we're saving the address after. Recurse, otherwise, um, return will just jump back directly to the recurse, and we have an infinite loop since we just keep recursing so on. And then we just jump to the beginning of the function, which is the beginning of our entire bytecode. And finally, return simply jumps to the position that we just saved. The entry point for our interpreters takes the bytecode and the single argument to our function. It then creates a vStack, a cStack, which are just arrays of some size. We initialize the instruction pointer and the vStack pointer. And then we want to push the argument on top of the vStack to begin with. And we also want to push a special exit instruction on top of the call stack. So then the first return, like the return of the first function, um, will then go to the exit instruction, which we can then detect and exit the interpreter. And then we just call dispatch. So this is the missing piece. This is the function that we're going to implement throughout the rest of this talk. So it takes our arguments for the interpreter state, reads the current opcode, executes the appropriate uh, assembly code that we need to like, um, process that instruction. And then repeats that until we've reached the exit instruction and are done with the execution. So this conference talked a lot about safety. So at this point, I need to make a disclaimer. Um, bytecode interpreters are really prime candidates for remote code execution exploits. Right? As soon as you, you can exploit them, you can control them. Um, so you should never actually start executing untrusted and unverified bytecode. That being said, this is a talk about performance. So let's ignore that and just go ahead. <laughs> 
So the most basic dispatching technique we can have to implement our bytecode interpreter is switch. So this is how, um, how it looks. So we have a while loop that is just while true for simplicity. Then we switch over the current upcode and execute push or add or whatever is necessary. And when we reach the special exit construction, we return from the loop and return the final value that is on top of the vStack. One uh, qualifier, um, so even though we actually covered every th single um, enum for in our switch, the compiler doesn't know it, and it will generate a bit of ugly code um, if we can't tell them. So let's just say the compiler that we don't have a default case. Otherwise, the assembly will get a bit messy, so let's ignore that. And at this point, I've essentially shown you the complete implementation of the bytecode interpreter. So are there any questions about that? Okay, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, you can also find the source code on GitHub. So to understand what the compiler is doing for the switch, we have to look at the generated assembly code. Who here can roughly read assembly code? OK, that's, uh, that's almost everybody. And when you answered that question, who was thinking about ARM64 assembly code? OK, that's nobody. Great. <laughs> so let's really quickly uh, take an overview of ARM64 assembly code, since that's the machine I'm running this on. Don't worry, it's a lot easier than x86. So we've got um, uh, some registers, x0 to x30, and those are 64-bit. Um, we can also access the 32-bit uh, by the lower half by using w instead of x. Then the uh, important stuff uh, to mention is the memory access we can do. So the addressing modes, for example, when we have a register which draws an address and we want to read the value that is at that address, we put it inside square brackets. And this is essentially a pointer dereference. We can also do a pointer dereference with an offset. So for example, we can read uh, x0 and plus 42 and then read that address. And this is an offset in bytes. Um, we also might want to do like add the 42 permanently. So we have a pre-increment and a post-increment. And this just adds the offset and reads it. And it either does the increment before or after, which is very convenient if you want to read something and increment the pointer at the same time. And finally, um, so when you want to read, for example, index into an array of um, uh, eight byte objects, you want to multiply the offset by eight. And for that, you can use the final index operation where you specify a less left shift by three. And this will essentially we do an array access into a 64-bit uh, integer array, for example. So with that, we can look at the assembly of our switch statement. So we've got the loop uh, begins at that label, and then we read the current upcode. Uh, we first compare it against 0. If it is 0, then we want to go to push. Uh, we then compare it against 1. If it is 1, we want to go to add, and so on. And if nothing else matters, matches, we go to exit. And then each push instruction or each other instruction just has a couple of ins assembly instructions. So push, for example, we read the next byte in the bytecode, store that in a register, then store that back onto the vStack. Uh, while doing the afterwards, we directly increment um, the vStack pointer with the post increment. Then we increment the instruction pointer by two and go back to the beginning of the loop. And when we reach exit, we just load the final value and return from the function. Very uh, straightforward code. In fact, this is so straightforward, it isn't actually what the compiler generated. Um, because what this d does is a comparison of the opcode against zero, then against one, then against two, then against three, which is like linear number of comparisons and the number of opcodes. So the compiler can be a bit smarter. It can sort of do a binary search. Um, so it gets a bit messy in assembly code. So here is it in C. So it first checks, is the opcode less than four? If so, OK, we handle the case. We know it's between zero and three. Um, then we do check, do a comparison against one. And then we only narrowed it down to two cases, so we either go to push or to add. And this is essentially a binary search um, over the labels that we want to do, and has log n comparisons, which is a bit nicer. So thanks, compiler. So let's um, see, the, see how fast um, the computation actually is. So let's measure the time it takes to execute FIP35. Um, this is the result. It takes 460 milliseconds. Is that fast? Who well, thinks 460 milliseconds for FIP35 is fast? <laughs> <laughs> Who thinks that they have no idea because I've given you absolutely zero context? Right? So how do we actually benchmark things? We need to take multiple runs because there's inherent noise. We can then report the average and the standard deviation to exactly qualify like what sort of is the level of noise. And then we can compare it against something else. Right? And just in isolation, performance numbers are meaningless. We need a different implementation. One tool uh, for benchmark that's really convenient, um, I found, is Hyperfine. This is a command line benchmarking tool. So you give it um, multiple, essentially, shell commands. And it will execute each shell command multiple times, report the ranges, the average, and then tell you which one is nicer. 
So th this is a very convenient tool, which I've used to do all the benchmarks. However, I'm not actually going to give you this, uh, the standard deviation and so on. I'm just going to give you the average, because I want you to do your own benchmarks to do the own qualitative uh, performance analysis. So we've just got a single benchmark. But let's just say, for the sake of um, this talk, this is too slow. We want to make it faster. So how can we make it faster? How to optimize? Step one is we need to guess a problem, like what's actually slow. Um, this can be an educated guess. This can be just a wild guess. So let's just make a guess and say that the problem here is branch prediction. So what do I mean by that? So the CPU executes uh, assembly instructions in phases. So it first needs to fetch the memory of the next assembly instruction that's going to execute. Then it needs to figure out what exactly that is. Then it can execute it. And then it can write the results back into memory. And the crucial thing is that this is done in parallel. So while it's fetching the memory, uh, while it's executing one instruction, it can already start fetching the next one and so on, since this is done by different parts of the CPU. So it can be done in parallel, so we get a nice speed up. However, this can only be done in parallel if the CPU knows what the next instruction is going to be. Crucially, if there's a branch instruction, like it has no idea what's the next one. So what does the CPU do? Well, it just guesses. Like it makes a prediction uh, whether or not the branch is taken to predict what's the next instruction. If it makes a correct prediction, it makes efficient use of the pipeline. Right? So we just happen to predict the instruction that was actually going to be executed uh, while actually having executed it partially, so that was good. Um, if it made an incorrect prediction, that's bad, because then it has partially executed it. So we need to stop everything, roll back the pipeline, and start executing the real one. So we want to always guess correctly. And this is done by essentially remembering the history. Right? For each uh, assembly branch, it remembers like, OK, most of the time we took it, so let's just predict and say we took it again and start executing it speculatively. However, what we are doing in our loop is like each loop iteration, we're executing a different bytecode instruction. Right? So what should a, like how can it predict anything? Because every time you're doing something entirely different. Like the branch predictor doesn't really help us here. So let's say. That is the guess that we had. Branch prediction is an issue. Next step is to measure to verify that it is actually the underlying cause of the problem. And one way to measure, uh, to measure in particular um, branch misses is using a Linux perfstat. So this is a tool that allows you to query the hardware performance counters. And in particular, we can essentially query how many branches were taken and how many branches were mispredicted while executing our bytecode interpreter. And then we get that result. So we've got in like the total length is the number of branches, and then the yellow part are the mispredicted branches. And we've got that many branch misses. Is that a lot? Right. In isolation, again, that is meaningless. Like we need something to compare. It. But let's just say for the sake of the, uh, the stock, this is a lot. We want to bring that yellow part down. So final step, how do we actually work around this problem? One way is to switch to a different uh, dispatching techniques. And the first one we're going to look at is called threading. Um, it's called threading, but it has nothing to do with threads. It's just the way that things are called. So yeah, no, like that's the, but this, it's the, it uses the same metaphor as threads, which is why it's called threading, but it has nothing to do with multi-threads. So the idea is um, to use an array of function pointers. So we've got a separate function for each possible that executes each assembly instruction. So we've got a function for executing push, one for executing add. And then we've got a big array of those. And then in inside our loop, we just directly jump to that function pointer and call that. So two things to point out. First of all, we're not doing a range check uh, when executing the lookup table, um, which is quite bad if we don't control the bytecode that is passed to us. So you shouldn't do that. But again, let's ignore that. And the second thing is, for example, push, it modifies the vstack pointer. So we need to pass the vstack pointer by, by reference. And likewise, we need to pass the instruction pointer by reference. So we just need to, to ensure that modifications have any effect. And this is the generated assembly for the um, loop. So we first of all need to create references <coughs> to all, all, all of those things. So we allow they are stored on the stack. So for example, the instruction pointer is stored at the stack pointer of the 24. So we load that into register x0. So now we've got a reference to the instruction pointer. And likewise, we do the setup for the other arguments. Then uh, this LDR instruction, this gets the takes the instruction pointer, the current opcode, and indexes that into the execute table whose base address has been loaded into address x20 by the setup before the loop. So now x8 stores the address of the function, and then the next instruction calls that function with the arguments we've set up before. When the function returns, uh, we load the next opcode into the register, check if we are done. And if not, we go back and repeat that process over and over again. So any questions about the technique of using function pointers for dispatch? Okay. So let's benchmark it. 
And so switch was yellow, the, that one is green, and this is significantly faster, uh, slower. Except it's not significantly slower because for the, bar for the benchmarks, I just picked an arbitrary website to generate bar graphs, and that bar graph doesn't actually start at zero. Right? It starts at 450. So that big spike is 75% difference. So like uh, many publications use bad bar charts, you should always like, look out for that. So this is uh, the actual, if you started at zero, you're so, we're that much slower. So what went wrong here? Like we, we implemented different dispatching techniques. We don't have all those branches, so why are we slower? Well, the main reason is the memory overhead here. So let's compare the assembly instru instruction of the actual, actual execute push instruction, for example. If execute push were to take everything by value, it knows that, for example, x0 stores the instruction pointer. And we can directly load that, get the um, opcode, get the payload from it, and load that into register. Then we can store that into the vstack pointer, which is at x1. We can directly manipulate it, and finally increment x0. But we're not passing by value, we're passing by register. So x0 does not contain the instruction pointer. It contains a reference to the instruction pointer, or in other words, a pointer to the instruction pointer. So the assembly first has to load the actual instruction pointer into a register. Then it can do the manipulation. And then for the vstack, it likewise needs to load the vstack, do the actual manipulation, and then store it back into memory. And similar, finally, when we increment it. And all those memory access and overheads, they add up. And the reason for those is that the CPU can only work when something is in a register. When we have a reference, they're not directly in register. They're in memory. So we first need to load them into memory, modify them, and then put them back. This adds overhead. So th that didn't work. So let's try a different workaround. Right? This is how you, how you do optimization. You guess a problem, you try to fix it, and then you repeat that until you fix it. So a different dispatching techniques we can do is token threading, or sometimes called indirect threading. And the idea here is to leverage a GNU extension computed goto. So you're all familiar with regular goto. <coughs> You've got a label for a statement, and then you can go to that label. It's really nice if you want to write readable code. With a computed goto, we've got two extensions. First of all, we can take the address of a label using this weird double address operation. This gives us the address of a label. And then we can go to that stored address. And yes, we're dereferencing a void pointer here in front of the goto, but that's fine. And now the idea is instead of having an array of function pointers, we have an array of labels. So we just we have a label for each instruction handler that we want to do, which contains the code. And then we create a table for that. And instead of calling a function, we just go to that label. And after we've executed a particular bytecode handler, we continue, go back to the loop, and start executing the next one. We look at the assembly that generated. Um, it looks very similar. So at the beginning of the loop, we load the current opcode, then we index into an a table, and then we go there. Uh, and then at, at the end of each instruction, we increment the instruction pointer by the appropriate amount and go back to the beginning of the loop. And this isn't actually, again, the assembly that the compiler generated, because it looks at that and thinks, OK, so after push, we do an add, and then we jump back to the loop. And then we do some stuff, and then we immediately jump somewhere else. Uh, this is a bit silly. Let me just fix that for you and directly jump to the correct place to start with. So it replicated the dispatching code from the beginning after every single instruction. So every like after push, it will directly jump to the next instruction instead of going back to the loop. And one another advantage um, the compiler was able to do is so before we got the add, and then we got a branch, and then we load the x0. And using it that way, the compiler was able to merge the two operations once. So this load operation already does the add for us in one instruction using the uh, increment operation. So we do the add and the load at the same time, and then directly jump to the next location. And because the compiler will always generate that code, like whatever I did, I couldn't stop it from generating this sort of code. The, this is also the sort of canonical way to write um, token threaded dispatch in C code. So you have um, the labels for each instruction, and then you've got the go to execute table after every single instruction, and just have a single one to kickstart the entire thing. And now you don't see a loop anymore. Instead, each instruction jumps to the next, which jumps to the next, which jumps to the next, until we reach exit, at which point we return. So this is why goto can lead to a bit of convoluted control flow, because this is a loop, but you never see a loop. Like you just directly jump all over the place, uh, over the entire function, which makes it really tricky to figure out like in which order the instructions are actually executed here. Any questions? Yes? Um, is this implementable in standard C++ without the extension? Um, not quite. Okay. Okay. So um, let's benchmark that technique. And look at that. We actually made our code faster. We're almost not twice as fast compared to the switch and significantly faster 
than the functions. This is because we've now got the efficient dispatch using the table, but we don't have any of the override associated with the call by reference. So that is nice. However, we started out saying, OK, let's say the problem were branch prediction. And all those jumps, they are still branches. Like It's literally the branch instruction that we are doing anywhere. So let's look at the um, branches. So up top is switch, and below is what we just did. So we've got significantly fewer branches, which makes sense, because we only got a single branch after every instruction instead of the binary search. But if you also got like absolutely fewer branch messes. So the CPU was able to predict them better. Why is that? Well, after the switch, we've got a single dispatch code. We've got one dispatch code that selects the next bytecode instruction, which means there's only one way, one branch instruction where the CPU can do branch prediction. But it cannot really learn a lot. So the only thing it can learn is what the instruction is most likely going to be executed. And every instruction is roughly equally likely to be executed, so that doesn't help us. However, with Reddit, we've got now separate dispatch after each bytecode instruction. And the CPU can learn all of those separately. And this is really nice, because essentially what it learns is, OK, after a push, we're most likely having a sub instruction. So it can predict that after push, we're going to go to sub. And then after sub, it knows that, OK, we're calling FIP, so we have the recurse instruction. Right? So it can separately predict like, what's the most common thing that's next going to on, next going on, and make uh, and get better branch prediction that way. So let's say we made it twice as fast, but let's say that is still too slow. How can we make it even faster? For that, we need more information. And one way to do that is using perfect code. So this will execute the program and frequently stop the CPU and look at what the current function, what, what's the current function it is in. So when we, um, so it records like the most common functions essentially. And if you look at the result, we spent 99.85% of the runtime in the dispatch function, which is correct. It's also like useless. Like of course that's what we're doing. <laughs> like we're doing dispatch. We don't have any other function. So ideally, we'd like to have separate functions. If we were to use like function pointers, we would have separate functions and get a more detailed breakdown. But we don't want memory override with separate functions. So can we sort of combine the two techniques into one and get the best of both worlds? And this is possible using tail calls. So what's the idea here? Let's go back to write the functions. So we've got separate functions. But instead of doing call by reference, we're doing call by value for performance reasons. Now, of course, when we modify the instruction pointer, that doesn't doesn't matter for our caller because we have a separate copy. So let's not go back to the caller. Instead, let's go directly to the next instruction, similar mm -hmm. to what happened with the computed go to. So now we can modify the instruction pointer and then call another function with the new value. And likewise, we still have um, a table of function pointers, so sort of like a mix of both techniques. So uh, one thing to point out is here, let's look at the call stack. So every time we do a call, we essentially need to push the program counter onto the call stack, similar to our recurse instruction, so we know where to return to. And then return simply um, pops that program counter and jumps back to that location. So we start with dispatch, which pushes the program counter um, onto, the, onto the CPU stack. Then we jump to the first execute, uh, push the program counter, jump to the next one, push the program counter, and so on, until we finally reach the exit instruction, at which point we po pop um, the program counter and go back to our caller, pop the program counter, go back to the caller, and so on, and so on, until we finally reach back the dispatch. Of course, this is not what's actually going to happen. What's actually going to happen is we uh, start dispatch, call that one, call that one, call the next one, until we have a stack overflow. Because we just keep calling new functions every time we execute an instruction, and we're going to execute millions of them. Mm However, -hmm. oh, luckily, we don't need that. Right? So we need to save the program counter to be able to return back to our caller. But then our caller just goes back to that caller, because we have the return, like we return with a function call. So when we go back, the Next, next step is to go back to our caller. So why not just go directly back to the grand caller instead of going in between? And that's the idea behind the tail call. So we start with dispatch. This is an actual call which pushes a program counter. Then we just jump to the first duplicate. Then we jump to the next one. And so we don't keep adding stuff to the um, call stack. Finally, when we reach the exit instruction, we have a single return. And that single return just goes to the program counter that's on top of the call stack, which is the one from dispatch. So instead of like having all the intermediate steps on the way back, which are silly, we can just directly jump back to the dispatch code, um, which is much more convenient and saves us on the stack overflow. And this is also a common optimization uh, compilers can do if you have a return statement of that form. However, we actually like we require that optimization. Without that, we will have a stack overflow. So we need some way to nicely ask the compiler to please always generate a tail call even in debug code. 
And there's a way to do that with Clang. Uh, Clang provides an attribute, Clang must tail. And you can use it to annotate a return statement to force the compiler to generate a tail call. This happens even without any optimization. In debug mode, the compiler will always generate a tail call. I really love this um, attribute. Unfortunately, it is only available <coughs> in Clang. It is not available in GCC. It is not available on MSVC. It's only available on Clang. And so instead of having normal calls after the end of each instruction, we're going to have tail calls. And this will ensure that we just jump to the next instruction, just like with the computed go to, um, but uh, without any of the call stack. And in fact, if you look at the assembly code, so we've got the dispatch code, which loads in the lookup table and then jumps to the first entry. And then after the end of push, we are loading the table again, and then we jump to the next one. This is exactly the same assembly code that we had with computed go to. The only difference is now that the table is global, so it first needs to load them from global memory. But apart from that, it is the exact same dispatching code. Yes? So just to clarify on the hmm. previous slide, why can't you ask GCC to enable parallel call optimization? Uh, so you can't ask GCC to enable tail call optimization, first of all, because GCC doesn't provide an attribute. That is only a Clang attribute. And GCC doesn't provide the attribute because GCC supports some esoteric hardware where it cannot do tail calls. Is this like an LLVM? Is yeah, this is an LLVM thing. Right. This is like this is like you ask the compiler to generate a tail call, and if it is unable to, your code will not compile. Right. So this is a guaranteed. Like if it compiles, it is a tail call, and I guess GCC they, do, they can't support that. There are some limitations, like the function you're tail calling must have the exact same signature. You cannot have any destructors in in, in the function and so on. But uh, it will not compile if that's not the case. Any other questions? Yes. Could you try to simulate that behavior in GCC using long jumps or things like that? Uh, I haven't tried simulating that behavior using long jumps on GCC. Um, I like I implemented that mostly for a hobby project, and I'm fine to just say just use Clang, right? So I just didn't try and work around uh, the lack of features in other compilers. Okay, so let's see uh, what happens when we benchmark that technique. Um, uh, orange line uh, at the bottom, and we are roughly similar. Like same performance as with computer go to. We're even faster for some reason, but I don't know. Like why? Why would we be faster? We're essentially doing the same thing. And unexpected, like not unexpected, like also a similar amount of branch misses and branch miss predictions. So we essentially just implement a computed go to, but using uh, tail calls. Which brings me back to that question. Yes, you can do it without computed go to, but you need another compiler extension. So I don't know whether that's actually practical. However, one big thing is since we're actually now having separate function, if we ask perf to give us uh, to do the analysis, we actually get a breakdown of the different instruction handlers. So we can see that 16% of the time we are actually spending in push. So now we know that, OK, we might want to optimize push. For example, we are pushing one a lot. So let's add a separate instruction just to push one, which can optimize that and bring the program behavior down, which is like really useful. OK. Um, Let's talk about the register keyboard. So the register keyboard is available in C. And you can ask the C compiler to please keep this variable in a register. As we've seen, the CPU can only work in variables which are when the value is in register. So we can sort of like ask the C compiler to do that for us. However, <laughs> normal modern compilers do it for you. So we don't actually need to tell the compiler to please put the instruction pointer in a register. Like with the register keyboard, the modern compiler will do that for you, which is why register doesn't have any meaning in C++. However, modern compilers don't always do that for you. So this is a quote from Mike Pell. Mike Pell is the author behind LuaJIT. Uh, besides a just-in-time compiler for Lua, LuaJIT also has a bytecode interpreter. And this bytecode interpreter is written in assembly. And in this email, um, he explains why he wrote it in assembly. So for example, you can say that we can use uh, direct indirect budget implementation with computed go to, which we, what we did. Um, this replicates the label and the dispatch for performance, as we've seen. Um, but one of the problems is that the register allocator can only treat each of these segments separately and will do a real bad job. There's just no way to give it a goal function like I want to keep the same register assignment before each go to. Right? So we don't want to do, when we execute it, we don't want to shuffle things between registers all the time. We want to keep the same register assignment for the common variables. For example, let's say we want to ensure that the instruction pointer is always in x0 and not sometimes in x1 and shuffle it around. And with computed go to, there's no way to force that. However, we are not using computed go to. We're using function calls. And for function calls, there's the calling convention. So at the assembly level, a function call is just a jump to an address. So where are the arguments passed? Well, they're passed in registers. 
on ARM64, the, uh, we've got eight arguments that can be passed in the first eight registers. So when we call a function, we put the first argument in x0, the next one in x1, and so on, and then we jump to the address. <coughs> so we can, when we want something in a register, we pass it as an argument. The bytecode, the instruction pointer, is the first argument, so it will be in x0 when we call the function. Sure, then the compiler can do whatever it wants and move it around and store it in memory and do whatever. But at the end, it calls the next function, which expects the instruction pointer as the first argument, so it has to put it back in x0. And this means, in practice, the instruction pointer will always be kept in x0 because why should he move it around, right? So as we can see, we've got um, in the code, we've got x0 is always the instruction pointer, x1 is the vstack pointer, x2 um, is the cstack pointer, and x3 is the bytecode. So that way, we can force the compiler to get a particular register assignment using the calling convention. So the standard calling convention on ARM64 gives us eight registers. So we can keep eight things, uh, eight things in registers using eight arguments. On x64 Linux, we only got six registers, which is less. And on Windows, it's only half that at four, which is a bit unfortunate. So at Windows, we can only keep four things uh, in registers. However, we don't need to use the standard calling convention. We are the only ones that call that function. Nobody else does. So we can just ask the compiler to generate a different calling convention, one that gives us more registers. And one of those yeah, is GNU recall. So with GNU recall is a calling convention that passes as much as possible in registers. So that way, on Linux, we get 12 registers, and on Windows, we get 11. On ARM, it does nothing since we already have eight. So we can now annotate if you need more than four uh, arguments, four, keep more, four, more than four things in registers, we can annotate it with GNU record. Yes? Uh, does Clang also support? Uh, yeah, Clang supports that, yes. And the SVC? Uh, probably under the different, cent I don't know. Like, I don't use, like, uh, MSVC doesn't support tail calls, so it's so kind of red. Yes? Uh, is there like a red lining for this? Like, is there like a performance impact? Uh, yeah, so the performance impact is that within one function, you've got fewer scratch registers, right? So if you need scratch registers, you'd have better things, right? But if the only thing you actually work with are those argument values, right? Then, then, then it's fine, right? So this is why it's not enabled. By yeah, default. it's not enabled by default because normally, like a function does actual stuff with temporary values and so on. And, but here, all the functions are like three instructions, right? Yes, Daisy. Why does the R64 ignore it? Uh, I guess because they already give eight registers. Like it's just like it's an attribute for x86, right? But it it could. It it could it do more registers. Like there are <laughs> other registers. Yeah. Yes? One reason why the register word was deprecated mm -hmm. is that if you try and lock down all your registers, there's no way the optimizer can work around Yes. It. And so it really, really kills performance. Uh, it really kills performance? It, it, it will, it's probably much better, other than your examples yeah. here, not to, to even try and do that. Yeah. Because <clears throat> even if you have to reload it from memory, it's going to be faster. Yeah. Than having to work around not having registers available. Yes. So, like in general, normally the compiler knows better than you what to keep in a register. Exactly. But this is like a very specific situation where we want to know better and like exactly generate the assembly that we wanted to do. So we can use that sort of trick to reliably force the compiler um, to not do stupid things. Okay. So the email uh, of my file continues. Um, uh, listing advantages of writing an interpreter loop in assembly. For example, you can keep a fixed register assignment um, for all bytecode instructions. Hey, we can also do that. Like using the arguments, we can keep a fixed register assignment. Um, you can keep everything in registers in the fast path and spill and reload out only on the slow path. And you can move the slow path elsewhere to help with iCache status, density. So what does that mean? So what is the iCache? So assembly instructions that the CB, CPU executes are stored somewhere in memory. And memory access is slow. So the CPU has caches. It has a special cache for the next for the current instructions, the iCache. And this is then filled preemptively with instructions. But this means that you don't want to pollute it with instructions that you're not going to execute. Right? So if you've got something that's only rarely executed, you don't want it in the iCache. You want to do the, keep the stuff that's actually executed in the iCache because it only has a fixed size. So let's look at an example. Um, let's add a stupid instruction, print 42. This prints 42 if the top value is 42. Otherwise, it does nothing. And this print statement, and there, this is a slow path, right? It's going to execute Excel work, do a syscall. This is slow. So let's um, change the benchmark. Uh, same implementation as the 
34, uh, like FIP35, but the beginning of each bytecode does a print 42. And this is going to do nothing since n is always less than 42. Right? So this will do any, don't change the behavior. We just have the extra instruction in there at the beginning. And when we do that, we are significantly slower. And by significantly, I mean four milliseconds because that bar graph doesn't start at zero. <coughs> Told you to watch out for that. So one factor here can be the iCache. We've got the, maybe the code for puts that gets loaded in there. But since it's like just one function call, this isn't probably really an issue. Um, the more important issue, like it becomes really obvious when you look at the assembly. So that is the entire assembly for print 42. Like, what is all that doing? So somewhere in the middle and in, in the bottom left, we've got the comparison against 42. And then we've got the branch. And if the branch is not taken, we call puts. OK, that's what we actually want to do. And then at the very end, we've got a, like, we load uh, our call table and go to the next instruction <coughs> after incrementing it. So what's all the other stuff surrounding that? Well, this puts uh, call is a function call. So it calls another function. And for that, it needs to set the argument in the appropriate registers. So x0 needs to be like the string 42. So it does that before. But that means that our current instruction pointer needs to be saved somewhere else. So we store x0 uh, somewhere like the move x22, x0. Um, this will set, uh, store x0 in x22. However, x22 is a register that puts itself might be using. So it first needs to store the existing value of x22 onto the core stack. Mm -hmm. So what the compiler is doing, it has to do a whole bunch of register shuffles just to ensure that the call to puts does not pollute our registers. So it has to do memory access, move registers around, then can call puts. And then at the end, it has to undo all that. <coughs> and this is a bit silly, because we're not always calling puts. We are only calling puts when, uh, like when we're having 42. So it would be a lot nicer if the compiler were to do all this shuffle only if we call before we call puts, and not like every time we call that function. And again, there's a way to tweak the compiler to do that. Instead of calling puts directly, we tail call a function that does it. So if uh, the top value is 42, we tail call the other function. The other function prints 42 and then continues executing. So we've sort of duplicated um, the code here. And now the execute print 42, it doesn't have any function calls, right? It just has a tail call to another function. So the assembly for print 42, it just looks as we expect. We compare it against 42. If so, we just jump, do a tail call to print the impl. Otherwise, we continue. <coughs> and then the assembly call for print impl, this has all the register shuffling. This does all the setup. This does all the memory accesses. This does all the slow things. And that way, we completely eliminated the overhead um, in the actual print 42 <coughs> function. And we've got the same performance again. And yes, in principle, um, like there's nothing stopping the compiler from doing that inside the branch. But I um, guess it's just that the compiler knows, OK, when we call a function, we need to preserve registers. And it doesn't look at whether or not the function call, how often that is going to happen. So it will always do that at the beginning and restore it at the end. And by using tail calls, we don't have any function calls. We move them somewhere else, and we get fast code. However, it's important that since we are tail calling, we cannot actually return. Right? That after, that, after we printed 42, we tail called somewhere else. Uh, or consider this example. So let's say we want to guard against stack overflow. So when we've reached the end of the call stack, we want to allocate more memory. This is slow, so we move it into a separate function. And after we allocated the memory, we want to return back to the caller. But we don't have that information, like we have in a tail call. We've lost all the information from where we came from. That is the entire point of a tail call. So instead, we have to do a tail call back to the beginning of the no last instruction we came from, do that if, again, this time the condition is no longer true, and continue. Right? You cannot just write a return, because the return will go all the way back to the dispatch loop, since that's the actual parent function. Otherwise, we've been just jumping around. So you have to keep that in mind. Any questions about that? OK. So climbing my style, I really love it. It enables threading via function calls. And this was sort of the, um, the, the conclusion that I wanted for this talk. So you can use Clang as tail. Uh, you get detailed performance records with perf record. You can force the compiler to use a particular register assignment, which is really cool. Um, but you need to keep in mind that you need to you cannot have any function calls inside the tail call function. Otherwise, the performance goes out the window. So move them somewhere else. And remember, remember that you cannot actually return. And with Clang my style, you can trick the compiler into generating the exact assembly you want. This was a nice talk, I thought. I could present that. I could demonstrate it. Like, this is sort of like I implemented my interpreter that way. I wanted to share that technique, which is why I submitted the talk. So I wrote all my slides. And then I thought to myself, just to be sure, let's also benchmark that on my old laptop, and not just on the Apple M1. So new benchmarks. Um, my old laptop at 2016, ThinkPad 13, running Arch Linux and Clang 14. 
And those are the results for our four techniques. And as expected, switch is by far the fastest. <laughs> like what? <laughs> but is it doing the login search? Is it doing? Yeah. I, I told you. Yeah. So let's look at the branch methods. We've suddenly got a significant amount of branch methods using threading and tail calls, right? That is like almost a quarter of all branches are mispredicted. OK, but why? Well, the answer is branch target prediction. So with the switch, we've got a conditional branch but a fixed target. So we want to do a comparison. And if it is equal, we want to go somewhere. We always know the fixed target. Like we always want to go to put the push label. But we don't know whether or not we're going to jump there. And with the um, uh, tail calls and so on, we've got a lookup table. So we load the address where we want to go somewhere, which is like <laughs> variable. And then we always jump. Like we have an unconditional branch, but we don't know where we're going. But on the other hand, we've got a conditional, like we know um, where we're going, but we don't know whether we will actually take that branch or not. And the job of branch target prediction is to determine where our branch is going. So previously, I discovered the branch, predi uh, branch predictor, which like ex determines whether or not a branch is taken. But an un unconditional branch is always taken. And there, we just need to figure out where we're going. And apparently, my old laptop just has a really shitty branch predictor, <laughs> branch target predictor, that is. Yes? Just a slight question, but yeah. the old laptop has x64, right? So not this kind of x64. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The old laptop has x64, but I'm still just showing ARM because it's more All readable. Right. Yes. So what, what do we do? Like, we somehow need to work around the branch target prediction that my old laptop has to do to get any performance. And we can still use tail calls. Because I like tail calls. They give you the function calls. You get the dispatch. You get the register assignment. We just cannot use a lookup table. So instead of having a tail call at the end of each instruction, we can write a switch. So now we write a switch after each instruction. And then we tail call to a fixed address. And that way, we still got the fixed address. Like in that case, we're always going to push. But we don't know whether we will actually go there. And that way, I still get the good branch prediction and don't need to do any branch target prediction. I still get a replicated switch because we're doing it after every single opcode. So I get all the advantages. And as is expected, I get, again, good, uh, like fewer branches again. So using the switch and the tail calls, we've got similar performance to the switch, while all the advantages of using tail calls, the register assignment, and so on, and the perfect code. So yes? Why does Clang not do tail call optimization? <coughs> uh, Clang does tail call optimization by default when you enable optimizations. Ah, uh, OK, so like you don't have the optimization. Yeah. Yeah, but like if we don't do tail codes, like we will have a stack overflow. So if you can't debug then the white code in you know, so you want the attribute in there. So maybe the real conclusion of this talk is just to trust the compiler to do this patching it knows best. Right? The switch, the compiler the, the simple switch was the fastest option. Except um, that isn't actually what the compiler generated for switch. It only generated that code for switch because I nicely asked the compiler to please generate this sort of code for switch because I wanted to demonstrate different dispatching techniques. The actual assembly generated, if I don't pass any special compiler flex to the compiler, looks like so. And you've seen enough example, assembly to know what that is. That is a jump table. So by default, the compiler generates a jump table for the switch, which gives me exactly the same performance as the other jump table implementation, which is just really bad on my old laptop. So no, we cannot just trust the compiler to do what's best, because the compiler doesn't actually know what's best either. right? We've got the switch. Um, and just we have to pass that flag to get the good performance on my old laptop. OK, um, since I gave this talk the first time, I've got a new laptop. So my new laptop uh, is a thing about X1 Carbon with an Intel Core i5. And this is the benchmark results on there. So I just ran them for completeness. Um, this time, like the, uh, like the, as expected, the computed go to or the tail calls are the fastest implementation using the lookup table. And the both switch versions, they still use the binary search. So they don't actually generate a lookup table for that. So I thought, um, like a couple of weeks ago, let's just for completeness disable that compiler flag and actually benchmark the native assembly code the compiler would generate if I just say, please optimize this code and do whatever. And the result is um, faster than the computed go to. So um, what's going on there? Well, um, now I actually have to show um, x86 assembly, because that is an x86 machine. Um, this is the jump table that we implemented in x86. So it's essentially the same thing. We first load the opcode, and then we go to that location in the lookup table. It's just the register names are a bit more funky, and we combine the jump with the um, address operation. So that's what we manually got. 
And this is the jump table the compiler generated. Um, OK, we load the opcode. Then we get the address from the table. Then we've got this add in there. And then we jump. Um, OK, so okay, we're we'll adding something to the register before we jump, which is, happens to be the address of the table itself. OK, so that's a bit odd. So, so this must mean that the addresses in the jump table, they actually store a relative to their base address of the jump table. So instead of the absolute offset, they are relative. But why is that better? Like we've got this extra add in there. Why is that faster? Uh, well, it's faster because if you look at the instruction that do the memory access, the execute table, if it's manually, um, it's 8 bytes. But if it's uh, the switch, it's only 4 bytes. Right? Um, the compiler generated a jump table, but I'm using 4 byte relative offsets, not 8 byte absolute <laughs> offsets. And because they're, uh, they're smaller or whatever, this happens to be faster on my laptop. So I don't really know what the conclusion of this talk is going to be. <laughs> um, <laughs> since like, we, could, we can't trust the compiler on my old laptop, but we can trust it on my new laptop. And the tail call technique is still really nice. So maybe it's just benchmark on the target hardware before doing any optimizations, because you'll never know what you're going to get. I want to point out that even though we had tail calls, uh, we, like this switch doesn't use tail calls, we can still use that technique with tail calls. Like we can manually implement a relative offset table by just using some reinterpret cast between function pointers and storing relative addresses and making them smaller and so on. So we can implement that technique the compiler did manually and still get the good performance. So tail calls themselves as a dispatching techniques, they are compatible with whatever the compiler, uh, whatever else the compiler is doing, uh, as I've demonstrated. So since we've got um, plenty of time left, uh, I will want to cover some more advanced dispatch techniques. So we had looked both at computed go to and tail calls. And essentially, they do the same thing. We just have um, like tail calls in one and uh, like go to. So the lookup table first contains labels, and here it contains addresses. And then we are indexing into an array using the opcode. What about we don't do that in direction <coughs> and say the opcode itself is the address of the handler? Um, this is direct credit. It can be implemented in both ways. So in the first one, we've got the bytecode op that is um, like we've got a bunch of addresses, and then we go to directly that address. Um, they cannot be const because you cannot initialize a global variable with the address of a label inside a function. So the first thing dispatch does, it initializes all those uh, constants. And then they're no longer modified, which is a bit annoying. It's much better with tail calls. They are the push instead of an enum. We have a function. And then the instruction pointer um, directly stores function pointers. And so we can directly jump them. And this is quite nice. Um, if we look at the generated assembly, we for do execute push, like we do all the logic. And then we increment x4, this time by uh, 16, since we've got 2 times 8 bytes. And then we just directly jump there, which is like really nice. right? This is the best dispersed code so far, because we just have one single jump. Um, the downside is that now the opcode is no longer an 8-bit enum, but a 64-bit address. This means it's going to be um, probably slower on this laptop, because it, we had the performance improvements when we had the 32-bit relative addresses. Um, it still requires branch target prediction, so it's going to be really slow on my old laptop. And it makes code, remote code execution just completely trivial, since you can just write arbitrary addresses in the bytecode, and we will just happily jump there and continue from there. So this is really nice from a safety perspective as well. <laughs> so let's direct find it. But let's say we have a code like so. So we push 1, and then we push 2, and then we want to put add. How about we just generate assembly code like that? So we get the assembly code for push 1, we get the assembly code for push 2, and then we get the assembly code for add. We just got all these chunks of assembly code, and then we copy paste them in the right order we want. And this is really nice, because the fastest dispatch is now dispatch. Just have the assembly code, um, add them directly in front. Um, but this requires JIT compilation. Like You have to sort of like do a JIT light. Like we're not actually generating efficient assembly code. We're still just generating like the same assembly code that we had for the regular bytecode interpreter. We're just concatenating it without any of the dispatch code. So um, with that, I've reached the actual conclusion of this talk, which again is benchmark on the target hardware before doing any optimization. Um, and now we can. Ha I'm happy to listen to any more questions or comments, and we can discuss advanced techniques. Thank you. Um, in the examples of the where you're passing everything 
as arguments. Were you mm -hmm. also passing the dispatch table as an argument? Yes, I could also consider passing the dispatch table as an argument. So we've seen like it first had to load it from a global memory, and we could eliminate that and get performance improvements as well there. Uh, but that many arguments wouldn't fit on the side. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, how would you use uh, these techniques uh, in the case of uh, doing a, a jump targets that are from uh, genetic programming template packs or, or whatever? Like, for example, if you want to implement uh, the visit uh, operation for variants, mm -hmm. you're going to have something put into your opcode of uh, the integer that uh, mm -hmm. tells you what, what alternative is in, in the variant mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah, so first of all, like I'm not convinced that this technique is really best suited for that because like like it's meant for you have a loop and the stuff and not like a single switch. Right? And then it's not really possible when you have the like you're passing in lambdas and you want to dispatch to lambdas. Um like those the advanced ones, they require a modification of the function you're going to, which is not really possible in C generic code. So there I would just write the switch and maybe ask the compiler to generate a jump table and not generate a jump table, depending on the actual um, computer you're running on, and just hope that it does the best thing. Which it did in like one out of three computers I tested it with, but yeah. So I have seen that, uh, that the compiler always generates a, a jump table if uh, you do things like, for example, preserving the, the order of the function call arguments. You can even have different numbers of uh, function call arguments, yeah. but uh, in, in exactly the same order, so that the subset uh, doesn't yeah. require the the, the and um, uh, there is a big difference, or there used to be a big difference between GCC and uh, Clang with regards to when they would uh, generate a jump table. Mm -hmm. and I, I think that you only did. Uh, your experiments with uh, Clang, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, I only did my experiments with Because uh, the, the, the behavior of uh, GCC is substantially different. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think uh, that Jody Haggins at CBBCon last year made uh, extensive uh, comments on how to do dispatching mm. within the context of genetic programming. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with that talk. But yes, like benchmark first before doing any optimization, because maybe the compiler already did the right thing. Yes. Just a note on that. The switch table threshold is fully configurable in GCC with hyphen hyphen param switch table threshold equals you, you set the size of the table where you want to go from the binary search to the yeah. to the table. So you can just play with that. Yeah, like I've used a similar flag to just ask to not generate a jump table because I wanted a different dispatch technique than the jump yeah, table. Yeah, because a, 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 a normal if then else in uh, Clang mm -hmm. for 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 constants that are numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, it gets translated into a switch statement or a, yeah, a, yeah, exactly. a table. But uh, a GCC, uh, as far as I know, have never learned how to control GCC to to transform an if then else, if then else, like a scaling if then else, mm -hmm. uh, into a jump table. But uh, thank you, Joe. I'm going to try the parameters that you are talking about. Yeah. yeah, there's also like on LVM, there is a talk a couple of years ago from this, but that discusses the optimization LVM does I one switch. Like there are like if then else, binary search, jump table, there are also like tricks it, it can do with bit mask. Like it's quite smart. When you give it a switch, it will usually just figure out what's the fastest way possible. So um, just maybe I'll add that to the, So all the slides are there, also the source code, I will maybe add that talk link um, there as well, if I remember. OK. Anything else? Yeah. What was the VM that you were trying to implement? Uh, so the VM I'm implement. Uh, so I bought um, bytecode interpreter that was designed to have like slow startup time, so it can be used to do like constant expression evaluation in a compiler. So um, that was my uh, target project that I implemented, which is why I'm also not implementing a JIT compiler. Because it's, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for attending the talk.